Thank you. The next item of business uh, is a debate on motion 7805 in the name of Ben McPherson on update on the Social Security programme business case. I would invite those members who would wish to speak in the debate. Please press the request to speak buttons and I call on Ben McPherson, Minister, to speak to and to move the motion up to 11 minutes, please. Thank you, President Officer. And since the passing of the UK Government's Scotland Act 2016 and the unanimous passing of the Social Security Act Scotland 2018 in this Parliament, establishing Scotland's social security system has been the biggest delivery programme since devolution, with new powers allowing us to better support the people of Scotland. We have already achieved an extraordinary amount in that time, and I pay tribute to the many people who have been involved in this shared challenge and success, including people on our experience panels, stakeholders who have helped us shape our benefits, the staff of Social Security Scotland, Scottish Government officials, and our delivery partners in the UK Government. We have achieved this together. Because Social Security is a collective endeavour, it is a collective investment in people. That is one of the eight principles enshrined in the 2018 Act, along with others such as the role of Social Security in reducing poverty, and that our system be designed with the people of Scotland on the basis of evidence, continuous improvement, efficient delivery and value for money. And together, we can be proud of what we have already achieved, including introducing, despite the pandemic, 12 Scottish Government benefits, 13 from later this month, seven of which are entirely new forms of financial support, which are only available here in Scotland, all delivered based on the agreed values of dignity, fairness and respect. Willie Rennie. Can I ask the Minister, does he think it's uh, fair or dignified to let people wait for sometimes up to six months to get their adult disability payment? Minister. I appreciate Mr Willie's, uh, Ren Willie Rennie's points and the uh, correspondence we've had on this matter. Um, many people are receiving adult disability payment efficiently, but there have been a number of cases where people have waited too long uh, and we are both proactively putting in uh, changes into the system as the system develops to make sure that waiting times go down. Uh, and I think that's an important point and, and much of my focus is on that on a day-to-day on -day basis. But as Audit Scotland said in their report last year, successfully launching new benefits during the pandemic has been a significant achievement for the Scottish Government. Social Security Scotland has performed well and its annual client surveys have been positive, for example, showing that 94% of people think that they've been treated with the kindness they deserve. This is testament to the way we deliberately take time to co-design our benefits with people who receive them, uh, one of the many things we are doing differently in our system. Right. Taking this intervention, Audit Scotland also made it clear that they had real concerns around challenging timescales. Um, has the Minister reflected on those concerns? Minister. Again, another important point, which I'll come to shortly. Next year, we will spend a record £5.2 billion through Scottish Government benefits, £776 million more than the funding we are forecast to get from the UK Government through block grant adjustments, providing important support to over 1 million people in Scotland. And this will double to an expected 2 million people in 2024-25, which demonstrates the scale and pace of the expansion of our Scottish social security system. By 2027-28, Spending on Scottish Government benefits will raise to £7.3 billion, more than £1.4 billion over and above transfers from the UK Government. And on top of that, we will also support people with, we of course also support people with discretionary housing payments, the Scottish Welfare Fund uh, and the Council Tax Reduction Scheme. Presiding Officer, our significant investment demonstrates the political choices we make in Scotland to prioritise support for the people who need it most, particularly during these challenging times including, of course, delivering our Scottish child payment of £25 per week per child for 387,000 eligible children. Last year, we launched adult disability payment across Scotland, a major milestone allowing us to make a real difference to people's lives, with no one being subject to DWP-style assessments or functional examinations. Last week, we launched a public consultation on the eligibility criteria for the mobility component of adult disability payment. And this is the first step which will inform the independent review that we have committed to establish later this year. Last intervention. Pam Duncan Clancy. 
Um, I thank the Minister for taking the intervention and to say the consultation has been underwhelming I think is an understatement. One organisation has described it to me as this. It really is something. Pages of notes about cost and numerous references to a fixed budget and precious little about delivering the support disabled people need. They say outright at one point major changes, and this is quoting the consultation, major changes which result in new additional spending will therefore not be deliverable within this parliamentary term. Don't think they could be much more clear that they are planning to do absolutely nothing with this consultation. How would the Minister respond to that? Minister. I, I, th I think um, that's an extremely negative uh, positioning of an important consultation and I, I would hope that Pam Duncan Glancy will be sharing this important consultation amongst stakeholder groups and encouraging people to apply because yep. we genuinely want to hear people's inputs. Yep. Uh, we are also investing in automated payments uh, so people get their benefits without needing to apply which is something we've, we've, we've developed um, significant progress on this year. And this includes uh, automatically awarding child winter heating assistance and carers allowance supplement. And I'm pleased to confirm again that we have now received the data we need from the DWP for our 13th benefit, winter heating payment, which will provide a reliable investment of over £20 million each year to support eligible households, more than double the £8.3 million provided on average by the DWP in its cold weather payments during each of the last seven years. As we confirmed last week, work is now progressing as planned and payments will be made automatically this month or next to up to 415,000 people who are eligible. Prime Officer, in its report last year, following the impact of the pandemic, Parliament will recall that three of Audit Scotland's recommendations were one, conclude replanning activity, two, set out timelines for remaining benefits, and three, publish an updated business, uh, programme business case, including refreshed estimates for implementation costs. We have published that business case today, a detailed and evidence-based rationale for what we are doing and the costs of doing so. The business case includes an uplift in essential implementation costs from £651 million in 2020 to the current estimate of £715 million this year, driven by the additional work caused by the pandemic and the positive choices we have made to support people, including creating, increasing and extending our Scottish Child Payment. In setting out the timeline for delivery of the next phase of Scottish Government benefits, I would like again to pay tribute to the stakeholders, experience panels and officials and ministers in the Department for Work and Pensions with whom we work closely. It is no secret that the Scottish Government disagrees profoundly with the UK Government over several things, including its approach to many aspects of Social Security. But by and large, those disagreements have not coloured cooperation on devolved Social Security matters, and I welcome that. And I'm pleased to be able to report that we agreed at the meeting of the Joint Ministerial Group on the 25th of January that the timeline as set out in the programme business case is appropriate and achievable and that both governments are committed to providing the resources required to ensure delivery. Presiding officer, it is hard to overstate the importance and complexity of case transfer. It is equally as challenging as launching new benefits and is made more complex still by the age of the DWP's systems from which we are transferring people. Therefore, I am pleased to, continue to, to be able to confirm that we continue to make steady progress on the safe and secure transfer of 700,000 disability and carer cases from the DWP to Social Security Scotland and remain on track to complete this work by December 2025. And I have to clarify, um, considering some reports that there have been today, that um, we, we used to extend agency agreements annually, uh, but we have now agreed to extend uh, to the um, end of, of, of 2025 uh, as we intend to complete trans case transfer. But we, we have also created a, a, a three-month contingency to March 2026 for safety and safety reasons only because, as I said, we remain on track to transfer disability and carer cases from the DWP to Social Security Scotland uh, by December 2025. All of this makes it really important that we continue with our measured approach uh, with the seamless, safe and secure transition of people's payments as a top priority. Our 14th Scottish Government benefit, uh, which will replace uh, and improve upon the UK Government's carers' allowance, will be called carer support payment. 
This benefit will be launched in a pilot phase by the end of 2023, ahead of national launch in spring 2024. And I will set out more detail of our approach to carer support payment this spring when we publish our response to the extensive consultation undertaken last year on carer benefits. Our 15th benefit, Pension Age Winter Heating Payment, will launch in winter 2024, replacing a winter fuel payment. And I'm glad to say that we have now agreed a two-year extension of the social fund with the DWP as required for this to happen. In the autumn of 2024, we also plan to introduce the pilot of Pension Age Disability Payment, our 16th Scottish Government benefit, replacing the current UK Government Attendance Allowance. A national rollout of this new benefit is scheduled for 2025. Finally, on the timeline, in the next few months, I intend to consult on the subject of employment injuries assistance and, re uh, and replacement of the, UK, uh, the current UK Government industrial injuries disablement benefits. I would like to acknowledge the work of MSPs and organisations who have an interest in this. Employee injuries assistance is a very complex area and it is important that we work with stakeholders to decide the right approach, recognising the limits on our devolved powers in relation to issues like health and safety and employment law. We also need to recognise the substantial costs and operational requirements of a new benefit and the challenges of moving from what is an antiquated and entirely paper-based UK benefit. I am pleased to say that the DWP remain committed to working with us to agree an approach which is practicable, affordable and, of course, in the interests of people, including current recipients. Uh, and it is right that we take appropriate time to consider this all thoroughly. President Officer, as Audit Scotland also said about Social Security, and I quote, the Scottish Government is preparing well for the next stages of delivery and managing the complex programme of work effectively. And whilst doing so, we are ensuring continuous improvement of our systems and building the capability of Social Security Scotland. These are absolutely fundamental requirements to ensuring that we continue to deliver for the people of Scotland and to keep to the principles of the Social Security Act. This sort of work does not often capture the attention of the public, and there is no reason why it should. But it is important that we recognise the huge amount of work required day in, day out to develop and then build on the strong foundations that we have achieved so far. In conclusion, we have limited powers over Social Security and a largely fixed budget, which has been shrinking in real terms due to rampant inflation. This and the practical realities obviously restrict what we are able to deliver. However, with pride and purpose, despite those limitations, we are delivering real and meaningful change through Social Security Scotland, helping more people in more ways and significantly uplifting incomes. And we're doing it by putting into practice our shared commitment to treat people with dignity, fairness and respect, to deliver Social Security not just as a public service, but as a common good and as a human right. And it is in that spirit of service that I'm pleased to open today's debate and to move the motion in my name. Thank you, Minister. I now call on Jeremy Balfour to speak to and move Amendment 7805.1. Up to seven minutes, please, Mr Balfour. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And I'm pleased to be speaking in this debate and will be happy to move a motion in my name. I would like to mention at the outset that I am disappointed that the Scottish Government chose not to furnish us with an updated business programme case until only one day ago. I think we can all agree that it would be much more preferable if we could have had a reasonable amount of time to fully scrutinise this document before coming to the Chamber to discuss it. Accountability, maybe not. In 2016, the people of Scotland were told that the Scottish Government will embark on a journey to create a uniquely Scottish social security system. They were promised that within a relatively short order and with relative ease, they would set up a system that would take over from a big bag, scary DWP, and provide benefits to all those who need it in a manner that demonstrates dignity, fairness and respect. Well, Deputy President Officer, it is clear that years between then and now have clearly not been kind. Far from the sunlit uplands that we were promised, devolved benefits have been a mess of missed deadlines, delayed payments and disappointment claimants. So let's have a look at the story so far. A story that, as my amendment notes, so that the Scottish Government is over budget, over time, and has woefully underdelivered. Let's take them one by one. At, one at, the, at every level, the Scottish Government has treated timelessly that we are committed to as if they are mere guidelines. The most recent example of this is the winter heating payment, that is fast becoming a spring heating payment. The payment that was due to be made in February 
in this year. However, as the Minister just confirmed, for some people will not be paid until March, means that many families will slip into need. This is good. Sorry. Minister. Um, I, I would just want to give Mr Balfour the opportunity to correct the record because uh, would he agree with me that I have actually always said that we will pay winter heating payment from February and the reason we are paying from February is that we were only able to acquire the scan from the DWP on the 31st of January despite requesting it at an earlier date but we understood the pressures on our colleagues at DWP and we are working together to deliver this important payment for over 415,000 people in Scotland. Jim Balfour. I'm afraid I don't agree with the Minister, Deputy Prime Minister, because this is what the Minister said at committee. To ensure that payments can begin in February, it, no, for, to begin in February, it is critical that DWP maintains its commitment to provide data to Social Security Scotland by 31st January to allow us to conclude our internal assurances for 400,000 records. The Scottish Government will once again try to blame the DWP for the delay. However, we cannot hide from the fact that the DWP handed over the required data which he negotiated and was happy with when he came to committee, said that was a fine time we can get those delivered. That's what the Minister said in December. He is rewriting history. And when did the DW hand over the data? 31st of January. To blame the delay lies squarely at the feet of the Scottish Government. And for the Minister simply to put two sentences or even two words into his statement today shows how little he cares about the most vulnerable people here in Scotland. On a larger scale, we have seen further delays to the handover of devolved benefits. The BBC has reported today that the DWP will be delivering benefits in Scotland until 2026, six years after the original projected date of handover. And I know at this point, presiding officer, that this mess is brought up by the same people that claim we could set up a fully independent country in 18 months. The people of Scotland will not forgive those for what promises they have broken. But not only does this government have a problem with timescales, it seems to be incapable of sticking to a budget. The projected costs of setting up and running Social Security Scotland have ballooned over the years. Running costs rose by 33%, or £65 million, year on year, between 2020 and 21 22. And this is only going up as more benefits at some point will be devolved. In fact, Audit Scotland has estimated that the Scottish Government is going to have to find £760 million by 2026 if we continue on the current spending course. This is not a small amount of money. And finally, the Scottish Government's programme for Social Security has been one that has chronologically undelivered for the people of Scotland. The number of complaints received by Social Security has increased by more than 400 percent since 2018. Claimants are unable to reach help. Chat lines have been broken down. People have given up because it simply is too backed up. People are having to wait four months for their disability payment application to be processed and some waiting six months for a decision. That is six months without vital aid for some of the most vulnerable people in our country. Simply unacceptable. Many Scots living in the coldest places have missed out on cash this year to heat their homes. And as Mr McPherson admitted to the Social Security Committee, this is the case, particularly for those in the north of Scotland. It has also become clear from evidence taken at committee that Social Security Scotland is not gathered required data to properly evaluate its performance in providing benefits. Without the necessary data, how can this Parliament and other scrutinised bodies properly understand whether the agency is fulfilling its duties or not. Over time, over budget, undelivered. Presiding officer, the Scottish Government has made a mess and we have simply got to get the act together. The people of Scotland deserve better and if you can't get that, you should step aside and let someone else have a go. Thank you very much.
Uh, thank you, Mr. Buffer. I now call on Pam Duncan Glancy to speak to and move Amendment 7805.2 up to six minutes, please, Ms. Duncan Glancy. Thank you, President Officer, and I move the motion uh, amendment in my name. I also thank the Minister for advance sight of the business case. The cost of living crisis is getting increasingly worse, making a functioning, fast, and effective social security system more important than ever before. But the updated business case published today reaffirms that people in Scotland are dealing with a system that is not these things. And in the handling of the new winter heating assistance payment, we can see that. The 415,000 people across Scotland eligible for these payments were told they might be paid this month, but now that it could be next. The SNP negotiated the deadline with the DWP to transfer necessary data for payments to be made in February. That deadline was met, but now the Minister is saying it could be in March. When you're struggling, every penny counts. And when you're freezing and expecting money that doesn't come, it can throw everything up in the air. That's what this government has done to hundreds of thousands of people who were relying on these payments. Saying they'd be paid this month or next is no use for people whose bills are piling up now. They can't tell their energy supplier that they'll pay February or March. The government have lacked urgency on this from the offset, when people really needed them to act fast. The benefit it replaces recognised the urgency of action in cold weather and was paid within 14 days. Social Security in Scotland was supposed to be fairer. Paying for a heating, a heating needed in the cold winter in March is not fair. I will. Minister. I just would like to ask if Pam Duncan Glancy acknowledges that, um, on average, under the cold weather payments system, the UK government system, on average about 185,000 people received that benefit, whereas the Scottish government's winter heating payment is projected to support around 415,000 people, exactly. including many people in Glasgow who would not have received cold weather payments very often at all. Pam Duncan Glancy. I thank um, the Minister for that intervention and as he'll know as I responded in committee, the one pound a week, which isn't going to scratch the surface, um, will be benefit will be and uh, people will I'm sure be grateful for that. But the bottom line is sixty five thousand people, sixty five thousand people on the basis of temperatures in twenty twenty one, twenty two will lose out under this government's process and proposed benefit. The devolution of this payment, as with others, was an opportunity to develop something new that would have a more significant impact on poverty and create a fairer system. But instead, the Government have created a payment that Energy Action Scotland have said is worse for fuel poverty than the one it's replaced. Poor planning, disjointed communications and a lack of pace are common themes. The Scottish Government have done well to create a more positive narrative. But that isn't enough. Under the surface, payments are delayed, processes are failing and Social Security in Scotland is being propped up by the DWP because three quarters of benefits are still administered by them due to the Scottish Government delays. Last week, the UK Government agreed to extend existing agency agreements for carers allowance and PIP until 2025 and for other benefits, including industrial injuries payment, and I appreciate the update today, until 2026. And in so doing, they were also clear that any further slippage would create significant delivery risk. This means that for many, it will be nearly eight years eight years after the devolution of benefits that they get the new and improved system devolution could offer and they were promised. Even where the rollout of benefits has begun, like with adult disability payment, there are problems. Devolution of social security could have consigned to history degrading and arbitrary measures like the 20 metre and 50 per cent rules, developed indicators that reflect the real experience of disabled people and delivered a rate of payment that reflects the real living cost of li for disabled people. Instead, the adequacy and eligibility is a mirror copy of the DWP. And the consultation on this says that nothing about it will change in this parliamentary term. In the meantime, disabled people across this country are struggling to afford to charge essential medical equipment. And they're just being let down. They're not just being let down by lack of ambition, but the lack of effectiveness too. They're facing additional barriers when making claims because the system's not supporting them the way it was designed. In an answer to my parliamentary question in January, the government told me that only 23 people had been referred from Social Security Scotland to VoiceAbility which holds a £20 million contract to provide independent advocacy. VoiceAbility themselves told the Social Justice and Social Security Committee that work to embed the offer of advocacy and information, systems, processes and training does now need to gather pace. Perhaps doing so and equipping people with the support they need when making applications would reduce 
the redetermination rates, which last year saw 86% of child disability payment applications awarded after decisions were overturned by review. This in a system that we were told would get the decision right first time. We were also told it would be dignified and fair, yet Social Security Scotland are spending an undisclosed amount on a counter-surveillance team. One of the worst aspects of the DWP system is that people believe it's spying on them, most likely those struggling the most in society. Will I get the time back, President? Yes. Thank you. Minister, just very quickly, um, would, would Pam Duncan Glancy uh, recall the, the um, session with Social Security Scotland Act Committee uh, in December, where it was made clear that the, 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 the counter-fraud measures that we are taking are to make sure that Social Security Scotland is not a victim of organised crime? Does she not think that's important? Pam Duncan Glancy. I thank the Minister for that intervention, but we pressed on that question, and I would be keen to understand more about the evidence that the Minister has of international organised crime trying to claim benefits from the Scottish social security system, that that is a significant enough risk to put money um, into a counter-surveillance team. So I, bet I would appreciate any information we can have on that. That is one of the worst aspects of the DWP system, and now it's been used here. Presiding officer, social security spend should be going as directly into people's pockets as possible. But unfortunately, a lot is being spent on fixing systems, including the IT system. Delays and poor planning from ministers have also created a system that is slow and not functioning as it should be, which is leading to operational costs far exceeding the government's initial spending commitment. Even worse, the Fiscal Commission has said that without proper tools and techniques to publish data, Social Security Scotland are limiting their ability to accurately forecast spend. What we do with the money we have is crucial. By not managing it properly, money that should be going to people isn't, and people are being led up a hill on a false promise of better security, while other budgets are being raided to cover the shortfall, stripping resources from other areas that can help keep people off benefits. President officer, the SNP, I'm afraid, have missed opportunities and wasted resources. They can't account for how they'll pay for things in a few years' time, and they're overspending on projects, under-delivering on services, and overseeing a system of chaos. This is not fast functioning or effective. That's what people were promised, and so now, in a time of unprecedented cost of living crisis, the government must do better. Give people in Scotland the social security system they've waited for for too long and that they deserve. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Duncan Clancy. And I now call on Willie Rennie. Up to four minutes, please, Mr Rennie. Yeah, thank you, Deputy President Officer. I mean, the transfer of the social security powers um, in the Smith Agreement in, after the referendum was a significant moment. It was actually the first time that powers had been disentangled from the UK apparatus into the Scottish uh, Government scene. Yeah, unlike other devolved powers, um, who were already devolved within the Scotland office. So this was a, a significant step. It was ambitious. It was the first time it happened. It was up to a £3 billion uh, pound budget with several different benefits involved. And we supported that. We supported the measures. We wanted to work in partnership with the government on dignity, fairness and respect. We thought it was important when we set up a new welfare system that all parties worked together to try and achieve something better for the country. Um, expectations, I have to say, were high, partly because of the expectations that the government set. Um, they contrasted quite starkly, not unreasonably, with the UK government system and tried uh, to make those significant ambitions uh, a reality. And then I think reality struck. Reality struck about how difficult these things were going to be. First of all, the delay of the transfer of the powers. In order to get it right, as the Minister said at the time, that this was necessary. But we are, as Pam Duncan Glancy said, potentially leading to eight years after it was first promised that some of the powers it will be transferred. But the system, I think, hasn't been managed well, I'm afraid to say. The waiting for up to six months for your adult disability payment, no matter how complex the case is, is really unacceptable. For I got a message this week from Social Security Scotland that said that some disability benefit decisions are taking longer than we would like. The majority of people will receive a decision within four months. Now, originally it was promised it was going to be two to two and a half months. Now the majority will receive within four months. We'll take an intervention. Yes. Thank Mr Rennie for taking the intervention and, and to um, build on my, my answer to his intervention on me on this point. I, I think it's important to recognise that that piece of correspondence would have also said, although processing times vary from a few weeks 
in, in many, many cases. Uh, and a small proportion of very complex cases when additional evidence is required have taken longer. But we are working to improve that. Willie Ray. But still a majority will have to wait four months when it was expected it was going to be two to two and a half months. So I, I don't think the Minister should brush this aside too quickly because I am worried about what other benefits are going to be impacted in this way. The child payment is going to be incredibly important, as the government has, has rightly said. It's going to be really important for tackling child poverty. Those ambitions are set out. The targets are very clear. The dates are not that far away. And if there's any slippage in this payment, it's going to be difficult to meet those targets. So it would be helpful to have absolute assurances from the Minister that he's learnt the lesson from the adult disability payment, that we aren't going to have a repeat with the child payment and its rollout, because it's significant numbers that it's going to, and we do not want to be back here. We've seen the problems and I've heard the explanation for the winter heating payment, and I understand that the, what the Minister said about from February. I get that. But there was an expectation it was going to be in February. And when you raise an expectation with people who are paying their bills now, many of them with prepayment meters who are desperate for the money right now, building those expectations means that people's confidence are crushed when those expectations are not met. So I hope the Minister is able to deal with this in his summing up, that we aren't going to be back here with the child payment, because the consequences are not just for government priorities and targets, but it's also the reality for people in poverty today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Rennie. We will now move to the open debate. Uh, speeches of up to four minutes. I call Paul McLennan to be followed by Oliver Mundell. Mr McLennan. Thank you, President Officer. The Social Security Scotland Act 2018 in its first words lay out the Scottish security, uh, security principles are Social Security is an investment in the people of Scotland. It is a human right and essential to the realisation of other human rights. The delivery of Social Security is a public service with respect for the dignity of individuals at its heart, and it will contribute to reducing poverty in Scotland and is designed with the people of Scotland based on evidence. It then went on to say opportunities will be sought to continuously improve the Scottish social security system in ways which put the needs of those who require assistance first and advance equality and non-discrimination. Finally, the Scottish social security system is to be efficient and deliver value for money. Everything we do in our Parliament in regard to social security should be guided by these principles. Social security is a demand-led service and Scotland does not have the fiscal flexibilities other countries have and that is a built-in disadvantage. I remember Labour Party members of committee voting against, the principle, voting against the principle of additional borrowing powers for Social Security in Scotland. In February 2020, the Social Security programme business case I have only got four minutes, I am not going to take an intervention, I am sorry, provided a view on the whole life costs and benefits of the Scottish Government's Social Security programme over a 30-year time frame to 2050. The five case model clearly explains the strategic context, rationale, socio-economic considerations, commercial considerations and financial information, as well as the management structures necessary to deliver social security benefits for the people of Scotland. The PBC ensures decision-making is robust and value for money are sure, and I will touch on that later on. The update we are talking about today is based on these practices. Since the unanimous passing of the 2018 Social Security Act, the Scottish Government has introduced 12 benefits, seven of which are entirely new forms of financial support available only in Scotland. And we should remember that. That is the context we are talking about in this debate. The Scottish Government, as I said, is doing all that it can with limited powers and a fixed budget. The UK Government must do more to fix a deeply flawed and adequate UK social security system. So I want to talk around about the social security system, living up to the principles that I mentioned earlier on. The social security budget allocation shows the strength of commitment towards building a future-proof Scottish social security system with dignity, fairness and respect at its heart. In line with Scottish Fiscal Commission forecasts, the Scottish Government is set to invest £5.2 billion in benefits in expenditure in 2023-24, providing support to one, over 1 million people. In 2027-28, this forecast increased to £7.3 billion, money which will go directly to people who need it most. Thanks to Scottish Government decisions, people living in Scotland have access to a range of social security benefits that goes significantly, significantly beyond what is provided in other parts of the UK. What has not been mentioned today, all benefits will be uprated by 10.1%. September rate of CPI in April 2023 at a cost of £430 million. The Scottish Child Payment is the most ambitious poverty reduction measure in the UK. The Scottish Child Payment is now £25 per week, a rise of 150% in less than eight months, with a cost of £442 million. Now, I heard Jeremy Balfour's speech, 
And I have to remember, it took me back to the time I sat and watched Tory MSPs sitting in silence, sitting in silence when we discussed universal credit cuts and the impact it would have on every single constituency in Scotland. They sat in silence. Officer, in conclusion, the Scottish Government has a clear and achievable delivery timetable for future benefits based on what has been learned so far, including during the pandemic. In, 2020, in May 2022, Audit Scotland found that the Scottish Government had responded well to challenges prevented by the COVID-19 pandemic and had adapted ways of working, including replanning, to deliver major new benefits despite the unprecedented disruption of the pandemic. This is the largest delivery programme and transfer of powers under devolution. The Scottish Government does not underestimate the scale of the work needing to be done next. The Scottish Government is working jointly across the Social Security programme and Social Security Scotland to address the remainder of the recommendations with clear actions developed and underway, and this will be a key factor for the, for the plans for the remaining benefits. Thank you. Thank you, Ms McLennan. I now call Oliver Mundell to be followed by Natalie Dorn. Mr Mundell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I have sat through far too many debates and contributions from those on the government benches in this Parliament where it has been suggested that all aspects of welfare policy and its delivery are easy, that there are no difficult decisions to be made and that more money must be found. As my colleague Jeremy Balfour and other members have already spoken about, who can forget the promises made to the people of Scotland back in 2016? We were led to believe that if only these powers were in SNP ministers' hands, that all would be well. As is so often the case from this nationalist government, the rhetoric does not even come close to matching the reality. And today's tone, whether it be from the minister uh, or uh, from SNP backbenchers, shows exactly the problem. Because rather than admit that they have failed, uh, they tend to tell us that everything is still all right, that there is no problem uh, and that people should just be patient. But take rather than delivering, I am not going to take an intervention, as your own uh, backbenchers have shown, four minutes is very tight time. Rather than delivering a radical departure from the culture and practices of the DWP, a point well made uh, by Pam Duncan Glancy, whilst I might disagree with her, it is the mismatch between that rhetoric uh, and the reality. At best, what we have seen is more of the same under a different logo. And at worst, we see completely avoidable delays. Real people let down by a government more interested in grabbing the headlines with flagship policies than delivering in a real and meaningful way. Today's debate is an example. A government minister and uh, a government serious about having a grown-up debate would have sought to work across the parliament and give a reasonable amount of time for the programme business case to be tested and scrutinised. It speaks to the same SNP knows best until it does not approach that I have already touched upon. This is a government that does not want to be questioned and which ultimately believes its own hype. If the shoe was on the other foot, you can guarantee they would not be so accepting of the same practices from the UK government, nor would they believe the excuses, especially when it comes to data. There are a lot of areas of concern, but maybe in closing, the Minister can start by explaining to me and my constituents where the SNP will find the £760 million needed to fund their welfare policies by 2026. Audit Scotland are right to sound the alarm bells, and many of my constituents will see this as the inevitable consequence of the SNP's failure to be honest with people about the cost of their welfare policies and who will end up funding them. Of course, we all want to see support there for those who need it most, but we cannot pretend that there are unlimited funds. Likewise, it would be good to hear the Minister's thoughts on the rising running costs of Social Security Scotland. Where will this end, and does he really believe the organisation is providing value for money? Presiding officer, people across Scotland deserve a government that makes good on its promises. They expect a government, at the very least, willing to hold its hands up and admit where things have not gone as well as it hopes. They want a government that not only believes in dignity and fairness and speaks up for it in this chamber, but one that lives up to those ideals in practice. At present, we cannot say with any confidence that this is what we've got. Instead, we've got a Scottish Government which simply brushes off concerns and makes excuses. After years of hiding behind the DWP, they themselves have been found wanting and have massively underdelivered 
while at the same time overspending. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Mandela. I now call Natalie Dawn to be followed by uh, Rhoda Grant. Uh, around four minutes, Ms Dawn. Thank you, President Officer. Apologies. I welcome the chance to contribute to this debate on the Social Security business case, which will provide a record investment of £5.2 billion in benefit expenditure in 2023-24. That is an investment in our people, and that is something that this Scottish Government should be proud of. It is also great to hear the Minister set out the next steps in building our Social Security programme. I have no doubt that the steps we are taking in Scotland are making an impact on our aim of tackling poverty. However, we do this under the most difficult circumstances, a global pandemic followed by one of the hardest cost of living crises that we have ever seen. Energy bills are through the roof, the price of everyday items are eye-watering and interest rates are soaring. People who were struggling before are finding life even harder and with a rise in in-work poverty, many have found themselves in a position that they may never have thought they would be in. The creation of Scotland's social security system was a mammoth task and one that I do not underestimate. Breaking away from the DWP system was always going to be difficult, but Scotland has made great progress and I am proud of the way that this has been carried out. We may have differing views in this chamber, but it cannot be denied that this is a fairer system and an investment in our people. The Scottish child payment... I'm going to make a bit of way, thank you. The Scottish child payment has been groundbreaking, and whether it is speaking to friends and family, constituents, or taking evidence in the Social Justice and Social Security Committee, we know that it is making a real difference to people's lives. I know that we'd like to see this go further, of course, but I am acutely aware of the limitations on the Scottish budget, and I think it is a testament, testimony to our priorities that this was raised to £25. The Scottish Child Payment is putting food in the mouths of children and taking stress away from parents. And if that is not a success of the Scottish welfare system, then I don't know what is. And of course, we could always do more. Under the current circumstances, it would take hundreds of extra pounds into people's pockets to truly tackle the issues that people are facing. In Scotland, though, at least we can say that that is what we are trying to do, with seven of the 12 new Scottish benefits being entirely new forms of financial support that are available only in Scotland. So I note the comments that I've heard on the winter he heating payment, and I, I actually find it really disappointing. I'll admit, and the Minister is certainly aware, that I did have my concerns around this new payment. However, let's be clear here. In winter 21-22, only 11,000 people benefited from the DWP's unreliable cold weather payment. In Scotland, 415,000 people are set to benefit this year. And like I said with the Scottish Child Payment, of course I would like to see us go further, but where can this money be taken from? I, I will take the intervention. Jeremy Balfour. Uh, I'm grateful to the member for taking the intervention. Would she agree with me that there was at least a perception amongst the people we talked to that the benefit would be paid in February and not after February. That was what people expected to happen. Natalie Dawn, I can give you the time back. Thank you for the intervention. As I'm aware, I understand that some people will receive the money in February and I'm I think the Minister was pretty clear that it was from February. So I find some of the arguments we've heard here today to be quite disingenuous. The opposition know the difficulties that we are facing and the lack of fiscal flexibilities that this government has. The projected costs for Social Security are set to rise in the coming years, and that is something that we will have to deal with. However, that was always going to happen. You can't welcome the Scottish child payment on one hand and then criticise the government for the increase in expenditure over the coming years. I am proud of the system that we have built here in Scotland. Charities, I'm sorry, I don't have any further time. Charities, organisations and local people are all extremely positive about the way Social Security is being rolled out, whether that is the ethos of the whole delivery, the priority of ensuring that people are receiving everything they are entitled to, or the ambition to make the system work for people. To close, presiding officer, the Tory UK government ch can charge on with bumping up energy bills, food prices, continue to soar in debt, pain, misery, anxiety that are all racking up for people in Scotland that need our help the most. But I believe the system that we have created so far is good evidence of the priorities and aims of an independent Scotland. And while I hear the sighs from the opposition when we raise the matter of independence, we cannot deny that full borrowing powers and control over our own affairs could benefit this country. 
Thank you, Ms. Dawn. I now call Rhoda Grant to be followed by James Dawn and Rhoda Grant for uh, up to six minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And um, that was a speech that finished with the Scottish Government again calling for more powers. Yet when they get them, they hand them straight back. It's truly unbelievable that again today we're hearing about further delays in implementing the Scottish social security system. A system that was devolved in 2018. Well, we will now have to wait until at least 2026 for it to be fully delivered by the Scottish Government. That's almost a decade late. The winter heating payment which the Scottish Government claim is imminent was intended to be rolled up out 2022-23 and we're in February 2023. Hopefully the worst of the winter is behind us and yet people are still waiting for that payment. This new benefit will pay a fixed sum of £50 instead of paying out £25 for every week of cold weather, which was the amount that was paid out by the benefit it replaces. I'm particularly concerned about the effect that this will have on, and this policy will have on rural areas. We know that the rate of fuel poverty is significantly higher in rural areas, which are largely off gas grid compared with more urban areas of Scotland. I'll take an intervention. Emma Roddick. I'm grateful to the member for taking intervention. Um, I wonder what her view is on the fact that Orkney, Shetland and Wick didn't receive cold weather payments at all last time around, and it's been very rare that others like the Western Isles receive anything when those are the areas that we both represent with the highest levels of fuel poverty. Ruth Grant. Those are the very areas that are going to lose out by this payment, where they would have received no, £25 for each week of cold weather. They're going to receive £50 as a whole, regardless of the weather. And even before the cost of living crisis, those living in rural areas faced up to 30% higher costs of living. And it'll be much greater now because of heating costs that was based on figures um, back in um, 2021, where 40% of people living in the Western Isles lived in fuel poverty compared to 13% in East Renfrewshire. And it's an average of 24% of all households in Scotland that suffer fuel poverty. So when you're looking at 40% in the Western Isles compared to 24% in the rest of Scotland, you see how that dif differs. And yet each and every one will receive £50 towards their fuel bill under this new policy. It's a policy that will cost my constituents hundreds of pounds a year, and they're the people most in need. Our weather is inclement and temperatures drop lower in the north of Scotland. Therefore, the very places that have the highest fuel poverty will lose the most. Energy Action Scotland have warned that lives will be lost due to the inadequate level of support provided. And we've already experienced a, a period of unseasonably early snow and ice over a number of weeks. My constituents are already losing out in the face of soaring fuel prices. And as Pam Duncan Glancy said, Energy Action Scotland also raised the concern that the new payment will have less impact on fuel poverty than the benefit it replaces. It is desperately sad that the Tories' cold weather payment is more socially just than the SNP Green Government's low income winter heating assistance. It's also ridiculous that the SNP Green Scottish Government took money from the home insulation schemes to cover the cost of a social security system that is failing to deliver adequate winter heating payments to those in fuel poverty. This is again down to incompetence. The only scheme that they are ever able to devise is based on one simple tick box. They are incapable of developing schemes that work. We look back at the agricultural payment scheme and shake our heads at the mess they made of that, and yet they've learned nothing. The poor design of their social security system has led to a 400% increase in complaints from the public. Due to their incompetence, they've had to hand back numerous benefits to the UK government to run on their behalf, but they have no say how these benefits will be delivered. 
In this brave new world of SNP Green Government, our disabled people are still left with a discredited 20-metre test under the Scottish Government's agency agreement, um, and that will run until 2025. And I'll take the intervention. Briefly, Minister. I, I just wondered if the member, um, if, if things are going um, so badly, which I disagree with her with, why, why did uh, the Social Security Directorate and Social Security Scotland win the Campbell Christie Holyrood Award last year? Rhoda Grant. I, I am not blaming the civil servants. I am blaming the government for their, their mismanagement. It seems very unfair that this government point the finger at others. If they are winning prizes in the face of this government, I can only pay tribute to, to them. Because, of course, the costs are out of control. This is a government that can't build a ferry on budget, so how would we expect them to deliver a social security system in budget? on budget. It shouldn't be a surprise. Their track record speaks for itself. Take the fiscal framework that doesn't work for Scotland, negotiated by the SNP. A health service with record waiting times. A world, a world educational rankings toppling under this government. They are failing Scotland, but it is doubly failing our most vulnerable people. Presiding officer, it's long past time this government focused on the needs of the Scottish people, but sadly they're letting down the most vulnerable. Thank you, Ms. Grant. I now call James Dornan, who joins us remotely, to be followed by Maggie Chapman. Mr. Dornan, uh, around four minutes, please. Thank you, presiding officer. Uh, I'd like to begin by thanking all the staff, officials, and ministers involved for their hard work and dedication in establishing Social Security Scotland and their continuing commitment to the development and rollout of existing and new benefits for the people of Scotland. Today's motion reflects their hard work. I echo the balanced tone of today's motion, recognising the UK Government's contribution to the joint programme of delivery of Scottish Government benefits, and that the commitment of both governments will be required to deliver the programme business case. Unfortunately, I was disappointed, if not surprised, at the Labour and Tory amendments table today no recognition of the hundreds of staff working tirelessly to ensure successful delivery or the many successes of those bespoke to Scotland. And I've just heard a rant from, from Rhoda Grant there about how the SNP uh, is to blame for everything that happened. But there's no recognition from these unionist parties of the Scottish Government's acknowledgement that future delivery will need continued close working between Scottish and UK governments. Surely that's something I would imagine that Rhoda Grant and others would have wanted to highlight. But no, none of that and nothing constructive as to future delivery. What a day when both Scottish and UK governments understand the need to work together. But here in the Scottish Parliament, as usual, the opposition parties offer nothing. So if they can't or won't remember, let me remind them that the agency, Social Security Scotland, was only established in 2018 and has since delivered a number of benefits successfully despite the complexities involved in decoupling existing UK-wide benefits and the introductions of a new one. First, the carers allowance supplement, an increase of 13% in the UK equivalent, surely a success. Then they introduced the Best Start Grant Pregnancy and Baby Payment, offering £600 on the birth of the first child and £300 for any subsequent children, and approved an, an, an improved and increased benefit, replacing the UK Sure Start Maternity Grant another success, and of course the most ambitious poverty reduction measure in the UK, the Scottish Child Payment, which is likely to lift 50,000 children out of poverty in 2023-24. And in the city of Glasgow, alone over 22,000 children have benefited from this. In any other world, this would be a huge success. In the eyes of the opposition, it's either not good enough or where is the money coming from? These are only a few examples of the benefits which have been successfully delivered since 2018. We should be proud of these achievements and give credit where credit is due, rather than continuing to talk Scotland down as the opposition seem to be intent on doing. Of course we can't rest here. We must continue to develop the system for the benefit of the people of Scotland. And we will. It's a complex process and ensuring successful delivery must remain a priority. Far better to take time, surely, than rush forward before we're ready. This is only practical and something I would have thought and hoped, to be honest, opposition parties would both recognise and support. So despite the complexities involved in disruptions such as the COVID-19 pandemic, it's important to recognise how positively the Scottish Government has responded to these challenges. 
the Audit Scotland report has been mentioned before, but as I said on it, the, the, the Scottish Government have responded well to the challenges presented by the COVID-19 pandemic and adapted ways of working, including replanning, to deliver major new benefits despite the unprecedented disruption of the pandemic. Also, the Scottish Government has worked closely with DWP and other delivery stakeholders to agree an ambitious but deliverable timetable for launching the remaining devolved benefits and completing case transfer including ensuring things for development and scrutiny of necessary legislation. And this is a sense of approach and the right approach. And just before I conclude, presiding officer, can I just say that my memory of the aim was to get things out in February, but that some of the payments might, might not be out to March because of the late delivery, understandable from the DWP. I do not think that committee members should be misleading the Parliament in, in the, st the statements that they make today. In conclusion, presiding officer, the benefits of today's delivery programmes will be felt for generations, so we need to get it right. I believe we are, and that is why I support today's motion and reject the amendments which fail to recognise this the hard work of everyone involved, and the ambition for the future. Thank you, Mr Thank you. Dornan. I now call Maggie Chapman to be followed by Emma Roddick. Up to four minutes, Ms Chapman. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The old adage that you wouldn't start from here applies, I think, to the social security system we are trying to create in Scotland. Over a decade of austerity, the two-child limit, or so-called rape clause, the benefits cap, cuts to universal credit, each of these and so many more decisions taken or policies implemented by the UK government make for a pretty bleak foundation on which to build our social security system. No, we would not choose to start with the uncertain foundation that the UK government has created. And that's because we want our social security system to support individuals and build the common good, to help create strong communities, thriving families and healthy, confident, informed and compassionate children. However, we are where we are, and in such circumstances, I think it is right to acknowledge the level of investment in our Scottish social security system and how this is interacting with and mitigating some of the worst effects of the UK government's austerity regime. And of course, that regime goes way beyond social security, the cost crisis, high inflation, increasing wealth inequalities. So I do acknowledge the significant changes, improvements that we have in Scotland today as outlined, outlined by the motion we have before us. Is it perfect? Of course not. Do we still have work to do? Of course we do. I also think, though, it is important to highlight what the motion does not say. The increase in total expenditure comprises mostly, 81% of it, of uprated payments to older people and disabled adults, increasing by £642 million, and the Scottish Child Payment, increasing by £216 million. That increase to Scottish child payment spending reflects increasing the weekly payment from £20 to £25 and extending the age limit. Modelling suggests it could lift around 50,000 children out of poverty in 2023-24. Do I wish we could do more and do it more quickly? Yes, of course I do. But I am proud of the role that Scottish Greens have played in ensuring we mitigate some of the worst excesses of the UK Government's cruel targeting of those in need like the uplift of the Scottish Child Payment and the benefits cap mitigation measures. On the adult disability payment and personal independent payment, there is considerable uncertainty about how much the transfer of recipients from the DWP to SSS and the elimination of exclusionary eligibility proving processes will cost in total. In 2023-24, the Scottish Fiscal Commission forecasts that spending on child and adult disability payments will be at least £171 million above the funding received from the UK Government for the devolution of PIP and ADP. And of course, there are other issues that make it harder to deliver what we would wish to deliver. The double onslaught of a UK-driven cost crisis and the failure of the UK government to adequately fund staffing in health and social care are both key drivers in the estimated difference between what money we get from the UK government and how much the Scottish government is choosing to spend, given the numbers of people who depend on social security. This essentially translates into a pressure on our budget that is forecast to intensify significantly over time. In 2023-24, the total Social Security block grant adjustment is forecast to increase by £657 million. At the same time, spending on new payments and benefits with the BGA increases by over 
and, uh, sorry, £1,057 million. So the difference between this spending and the BGA funding is forecast to increase from £374 million this year to £776 million next year. Again, this reflects the difference between the inclusive Scottish and the exclusionary UK approaches. But it also further highlights the double onslaught I mentioned earlier. Pressure on public services is intensifying across the board, in large part because of the UK-driven cost crisis and austerity. You need to conclude, Ms Chapman. So, in closing, we are making progress with Scottish Social Security, despite these profound pressures. Of course, we still have work to do to deliver what I and others want, a social security system that is an in integral feature of a welfare state, contributing to the sustaining of a well-being economy. And I'd you like do to need to conclude, Ms. Chapman. We are expressed to all those who are helping us deliver this. Thank you. Thank you. We are short of time. I'm going to have to ask members to stick to their speaking allocations. I call Emma Roddick to be followed by Megan uh, Gallagher for around four minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, earlier, Jeremy Balfour invited us to, to look at the story so far, so I'm, I'm going to do just that. Um, Twelve benefits have been introduced, 13 later this month, by a new progressive social security agency, one which treats benefit claimants with dignity, fairness and respect instead of suspicion and disdain. Seven of those benefits are only available in Scotland. The Scottish Child Payment and Best Start grants are already playing a huge part in tackling child poverty by providing parents with financial support which they have complete control over what to do with. These unique benefits show very clearly what the priorities of this government are tackling child poverty and the cost of living crisis. I would say it takes longer to do things right, but looking at the, the DWP's efforts on universal credit, which is still being rolled out full of faults over 10 years since the legislation that brought it in, that's possibly not true. However, it is worth us doing this right. It is worth us listening to the disabled people who said that they would rather be treated with respect, would rather be able to rely on payments, would rather that the system that administers benefits is compatible with the government later deciding to uprate benefits, rather than the archaic systems the DWP has, which, according to claims by UK government ministers, does not allow them to increase payments if they want to. I'm sorry, I don't have time. It is worth noting that many long processing times are due to the fact that Social Security Scotland has taken a lot of the life admin burden off of applicants and it's seeking to gather evidence when the applicant hasn't been able to get it themselves. Now that is going above and beyond and I'm sure that it's appreciated by those who are making use of it, those who would previously have been completely precluded from accessing benefits like this. We have to, of course, look forward at what is yet to be achieved as well as what already has been. I know of many constituents who will be reassured by the update on both carer support payment and pension age disability timescales. I have already been contacted by multiple people who don't want to face dealing with the DWP and applying for attendance allowance, which is a position I sincerely understand as someone who has experienced humiliating and degrading assessment by external assessors the DWP contracted. Having seen how welcome the changes brought in with child disability payment and adult disability payment have been, and what a difference it makes to have these benefits administered by an agency which values the dignity of those who apply and values the lives and experiences of them, those who are speaking to me are looking forward to the 14th and 15th benefits that will be delivered. I had the real pleasure of visiting my own local delivery team for the Highlands at the end of last year, and I was really pleased to hear about the culture that staff are working within. People at all levels of the organisation told me that they felt their concerns were listened to and that their suggestions were valued by leadership. There are, of course, things to be worked on and improved upon, but what a difference it makes in being able to address issues when everyone involved is willing to listen and willing to make changes when needed. There have been a lot of issues aired today, and I'm sure that we'll discuss in Social Justice, Social Security Committee, and probably again in this chamber, um, those which need attention. More than that, though, I hope that the message that our constituents hear loud and clear from this debate today is that the Scottish Government and Social Security Scotland are both working hard to make their experience of, of claiming benefits as easy and painless as possible. I hope that my constituents hear the Minister say that he wants people to feel the dignity, fairness and respect that's been built into the social security system. 
I hope that is the takeaway, and I hope that colleagues in whatever party will work with their local delivery teams to spread this information to constituents about what is available to them and how they can access it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rowe. I now call Megan Gallagher to be followed by Bob Doris. Uh, up to four minutes, Ms. Gallagher. Thank you, Presiding Officer. During the lead-up to the 2014 referendum, the SNP boasted that they could set up a fully independent state within a mere 18 months. Following the referendum, when the clear majority voted to remain in the United Kingdom, the Scotland Act set out a route map to devolve more powers to Holyrood. These changes included an additional 11 welfare powers worth £3 billion. This accounted for roughly 15 per cent of social security spending in Scotland. Now, considering the SNP's highly critical stance over the current system for administering benefits in the United Kingdom, this was their big opportunity to look at a new approach when setting up Social Security Scotland. However, it seems like this government has one talent, a talent for making an absolute mess of every single area of devolved competency, or, in the case of this government, devolved incompetency. The SNP were full of grand promises that the Scottish benefit system would be fully operational by the end of the 2021 parliamentary term. But that didn't happen. Instead, Scotland has had to endure years whereby benefits are being kicked back and forward between Holyrood and Westminster. No, sorry, I've got four minutes. Adding further embarrassment to this SNP government, they have now handed back the severe disablement allowance to the DWP because, according to the former Social Security Secretary, there would be no advantage to Social Security Scotland delivering it. It's clear to everyone that this government did not have the right mechanisms in place, and that, to me, is a scary thought, considering they thought they were going to win in 2014. At one point during the independence referendum campaign, Alex Salmon boldly claimed that it would only cost £200 million to set up an independent Scotland. Yet, setting up Social Security Scotland has already cost the public purse £651 million. It is obvious that their 18-month fully independent Scotland claims were clearly pie-in-the-sky thinking, just like their current plans to hold another referendum. Presiding officer, it is not only the handover of devolved powers that has led to another failed promise of this SNP government. Since its implementation, Social Security Scotland has performed poorly, with waiting times for applications increasing and payments not being made on time. Whether it is less than half of the people aided by the Fair Start Scotland scheme, sustaining employment or applications processing times increasing year on year for Best Start Foods, it is concerning that the SNP seem totally incapable of getting to grips with these new welfare systems. And most recently, MSPs were told that the winter heating payment could now be delayed until March. The question I must ask is, what on earth is this government doing? It's certainly not focusing on the creation of a benefit system that supports Scots. The SNP need to urgently explain how it intends to fix the mess that they've created and how new and expanded benefits will be funded on top of its, on top of its increasing demand. Presiding officer, I believe in devolution. I was only seven years old when this parliament opened and I grew up in a country that has the advantages of having two parliaments. However, the SNP are making a mockery of devolved government by not being able to get the basics right. I believe the ability to support those in need is a vital role for any government. If the SNP continues to make a mess of the rollout of Social Security Scotland, it will make a mockery of the Scotland Act and this parliament. Crucially, the failure of this SNP government to get this right will have let down the thousands of Scots who rely on these benefits, and that presiding officer would be shameful. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Gallagher. We now move to the final speaker in the open debate. Um, Bob Doris again. Up to four minutes, Mr Doris. Thank you, presiding officer. As a previous convener of this Parliament's Social Security Committee, one of my most memorable experiences was a visit to, the, to meet with the civil service team tasked with delivering the IT and wider delivery systems which underpin Scotland's ambition to embed a nimble, modern and progressive social security system uh, in place. I was left in no doubt over the complexities involved, as well as regarding the clear competence of the team that they had to deliver those tasks, something we have not often heard this, morning, this, evening, eh, this afternoon rather, from opposition speakers. An Audit Scotland in May last year said their very first sentence in the report on Social Security in Scotland is, the Scottish Government has continued to successfully deliver new and complex Social Security benefits in challenging circumstances. You wouldn't know that to listen to opposition speakers here this afternoon. They are detached from reality. 
So with 12 social security benefits now up and running, and with a 13th now imminent, the Scottish winter heating payment, I want to actually take time to congratulate the delivery team who have brought us to this stage, not disparage them, as some have done in this place this afternoon. We should, remember, we should remember that our Social Security Act was only passed in 2018. The pace of delivery and achievement has been remarkable as we look set to deliver £5.2 billion in benefits expenditure in 2023-24 to over 1 million citizens. The Scottish Social Security payment, eh, which has understandably attracted the most attention, has been the Scottish Child Payment, rightly so. Let us not forget the ask of campaigners. I remember the ask of campaigners when that payment was first discussed. It was £5 per week. Our Scottish Government, the SNP Scottish Government, is now delivering £25 per week to 387,000 eligible children, an annual investment of £442 million, and in doing so could lift up to 50,000 children out of poverty, as Willie Rennie noted. I have no doubt that the UK... Tory cost of living crisis would have pushed even more families deep into poverty if it was not for Scotland's groundbreaking Scottish child payment. However, we are currently in the process of undertaking one of the most challenging aspects of our new social security system here in Scotland, and that is the safe, secure and reliable transfer of those adults on PIP over to adult Scottish dis disability payments. Of course, new claimants can currently apply direct for that payment, we are open for applications. It will be more dignified, it will be more humane. And yes, of course, we have to speed up the process as best we can also. However, I want to talk about the, a constituent who is in the process of transferring from PIP to the new Scottish Disability Benefit. In December 2022, they decided to contact DWP as their mobility had significantly deteriorated. They wanted to be assessed for the mobility component. Up until that point, they hadn't applied for that. However, the DWP informed my constituent that as his benefit was to be transferred to the new Scottish system, he couldn't apply. My constituent has been informed transfer will take place on the 13th of April this year, and that given there is an up to an 18-week wait for DWP to assess for a mobility component, that he will not be given a reassessment under DWP. He will have to wait till he's transferred. The constituent must apply for the mobility component after his PIP has been transferred successfully and securely on the 13th of April 2023 to Social Security Scotland. Now, Minister, if there's another three months after that before he's able to be reassessed, we could be looking at six, seven, eight months from when he first, from when my constituent rather, first said to DWP his mobility is deteriorating and he'd like to be considered for dis the, the mobility component. I have no idea whether Social Security Scotland is able to flag that up in their systems. Will it be passed from DWP to make sure that their benefit can be backdated to December last year? Because they shouldn't lose out because of the safe, secure and stable transition of benefits. And you're summing up, Minister, I would welcome you to take account of my constituents' case so I can update them in the best way forward. Thank you very much, Mr Doris. We now move to closing speeches and I call Pam Duncan Glancy for up to six minutes. Ms Duncan Glancy. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And I'd like to start by thanking members across the Chamber for the contributions. And I understand the concerns that have been raised and also the, the, the heaviness of heart that I can hear um, from some of the SNP benches when, when they hear some criticism of, of what's happening. Because I do believe that this Parliament, when it set out to devolve Social Security benefits, did so in a way that they believed that we could create a system here that would work for the people of Scotland. I'd also like to say a massive thank you to the organisations working across Scotland today tirelessly to campaign for that better so social security system. I thought Willie Rennie's contribution was spot on when he highlighted that everyone's expectations when we devolved social security in Scotland were high. They were. And I have to say, they still are. And I believe that the situation that has been outlined that we've heard about today can be turned around. That's why I won't apologise for pressing the government to do more, faster and to plan properly. Because this is about lives, it is about paying bills, it's about meeting extra costs and lifting people from poverty. We have an opportunity to do that here in Scotland. We should seize it. Members noted the difference between this government's approach and the Tories. And I, I acknowledge those differences. The language, the narrative, the differing options, op 
options for assessment and better roles for recipients, own doctors and supports. And there are others that we've heard, including from Bob Doris um, in the speech that he's just gave. Contrasting, of course, with the increasingly hostile environment in benefits from this Tory government, one I believe that most colleagues, even on the benches opposite, would probably not wish to associate too, so, too closely. But the bar for a benefit system cannot be and should not be the one that we are seeing from this Tory government. So yes, I, I understand Bob Doris and James Dornan's um, frustration and others um, when they're highlighting government successes and challenging those of us who want it to be better. But I'd press them on the examples they've used. I'm not sure that carers thought that not getting their carers allowance doubled, uh, carers uh, um, allowance assistance doubled after being told they would was a success, or that waiting until halfway through the next decade for changes to the rules for that benefit is a success. Nor do I think the families with over six-year-olds who had to wait two years for their payments will think the system a huge success either. It is possible, it is, it is possible that it, two things can be true. A well-intentioned intervention can be well-intentioned, but it can also not be well-delivered, and I think that is what's happening here. This is not talking Scotland down. This is talking the truth, and it is because I want life in Scotland to talk, I want to talk Scotland up, that I care so much about getting it right. And on the safe and secure transfer um, that I heard members, including Emma Roddick and others, mention, members of the Social Justice and Social Security Committee will remember hearing from civil society organisations that disabled people might not have prioritised safe and secure transfer if they thought it would mean getting no more money or being left with the DWP until halfway through the next decade. So yes, we on these benches and others across the chamber can recognise success. And I have said several times where I think the government have it right. And I, pay, I too pay tribute to the civil servants who are working tirelessly on this. But they too are fed up, and I know that because I've spoken to them in recent days. Natalie Dawn expressed disappointment at concern from our benches about spend. And so I say to Natalie Dawn that if the money was going direct into people's pockets, I wouldn't be complaining about it. But it's not. Significant sums are going to an IT system that is overspent and under-delivering and an advocacy project that's not reaching the people it should. Those are my concerns. People want and expect more, and so they should. I believe we all believe that. I will. Natalie Dawn. The member for that intervention. When I made that point, I was referring specifically to the Scottish Child Payment, which I would argue is money that is going directly into people's po pockets. Would the member not agree? Pam Duncan Glancy. I would agree, and I, and I welcome that. And we, we called on the government, along with other activists and campaigners across Scotland, to double that and to increase the payment so that it could help mitigate the poverty that children experience. And I, I have said that we welcome that payment in the past. My argument about the money that we're spending is that we're also spending money in ways that absolutely means that that money could be going. £39 million additional expenditure on an IT system because we did a minimum viable product rather than a fully functioning IT system. That could have been going into people's pockets and it's not. Those are the concerns I have. The Minister said it is with pride and with purpose that they will continue with this programme. And I hope so. I really do. Because I believe in the most part that the intentions of the Minister are good. We just really must make them a reality. And I hope that that will come for the people of Scotland sooner rather than later. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Duncan Glanty. And I call uh, Miles Briggs for up to seven minutes, Mr Briggs. Thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. And uh, like Pam, Pam Duncan Glancy, I'll maybe start my closing speech with regards to Willie Rennie's uh, speech in this debate today, because I think he did do a very fair and honest assessment of where we find ourselves today. And I, I do actually believe the Minister is one of the more thoughtful Ministers in this Government. But after 16 years in office, what we've heard today has been the usual SNP and Green same, same difference, I suppose, press office lines of blame Westminster, blame the DUP. We've also heard the lines of everyone's talking Scotland down and we're using Social Security Scotland staff. We're not praising them. And SNP and Green members want to use them as a human shield in this case. But we need to rise above that and look towards what needs to be a system that delivers for the people of Scotland. And I have said this in every single debate since being uh, given this role in Parliament, because it is in all of our interests to make sure that Social Security Scotland is a success and is able to deliver for the people of Scotland and future governments which want it to deliver for the people of Scotland as well. And Parliament has that crucial role to play in holding both the institution, uh, Social Security Scotland, but also this SNP Green Government to account in ensuring transparency is delivered. And it is concerning that Parliament has only been given sight of the updated Social Security 
programmes business just one day before this debate taking place. It's not given us time to be able to do that role. And looking at the motion ministers have brought forward today, I think we need to see a more honest discussion over where the Scottish Government um, and where the Scottish Government acknowledges the many and increasing challenges facing secure, Social Security Scotland. Oliver Mundell made an excellent speech and I think it is important that we do understand that MSPs from across this chamber will be hearing from constituents who are complaining about the service they are receiving and the delay to payments and the fact that ministers have not kept their promises on what they said Social Security Scotland would deliver for people across Scotland. Because despite the claims by SNP and Green ministers claiming all is well, it must be said that the transitional arrangements are not. And the fact that we now see uh, DWP and UK ministers having to provide contingencies and extension agreements, um, agency agreements, to help support that ongoing delivery of welfare payments in Scotland just demonstrates where we are and the fact that ministers have not delivered. Promises made by SNP ministers around the establishment capabilities of Social Security Scotland have come and gone often with elections when they say these would be met. And Rhoda Grant made a number of good points, I think, as well. It is clear that the days of virtual signalling by this SNP Green government have now been replaced with the cold reality of having to deliver on a plan, and what is now a plan which will run to 2025 to meet these agreements. Megan Gallagher and other speakers also stated the honest fact that ministers said to the people of Scotland that they would establish an independent country in 18 months, but have failed to deliver a social security system more than a decade since having the powers to do that. This is despite promises that this new system would be in place by 2021, and I was on many panels with other members of the government who said that would be happening as well. Now, Audit Scotland have been clear, and I think this is an important part of today's debate, that they have continued be, uh, to continuously expressed concern around, around these challenging timescales regarding the delivery. And I think that is still the case today. And when they're looking at this, I doubt 2025 might also be uh, where they think this can be delivered. Any government body or government quango needs to have this full transparency. And Scottish people, I think, rightly expect us as a parliament to make sure that resources being spent in this area are managed effectively and deliver value for money for the Scottish taxpayer ultimately. That is important and the record of this government is not good in this area. You know, just looking at the, the facts of what we see with Social Security Scotland, the number of complaints has increased by more than 400 per cent since 2018. SNP government has missed deadlines for transferring benefits um, since 2020. They've had to hand back, and this is one of the points of debate I think has been missed, severe dis disablement allowance to the DWP for the reason that they see no advantage of SSS delivering it. Now, these issues we should have been looking at in more detail, why the organisation hasn't been able uh, to make what is these benefits um, actually delivered on time. And it's a crucial issue because without robust data, it's also going to be more and more difficult uh, to have that comparable argument and look at what is a critical role of the Parliament going forward and committees to effectively scrutinise Social Security Scotland. And indeed, whether these new welfare payments, which we have supported across this uh, chamber, are actually delivering the key outcomes we all want to see uh, them achieve and lifting children out of poverty has been mentioned by a number of speakers being the key one. MSPs from across the chamber will no doubt be receiving complaints and just this morning I was dealing with constituents who have really become tired of phone calls not being answered and are giving up. So I don't think we're even getting a real estimate of, of the full extent of where people are giving up on the system. And I think that is concerning and something ministers have acknowledged uh, in committee, but we need to see improve. The future for financial sustainability of new benefit payments is also uh, critical, and that's been raised by a number of members in this debate. Uh, we need to see and find out where, by the end of this Parliament, spending seven, over £700 million on new welfare payments, where will that actually come from, and how will that be paid? Um, to conclude, uh, Deputy President Officer, I hope today's debate has genuinely presented a bit of a reality check uh, for Scottish Government Ministers. This isn't maybe the de debate they, they hoped of patting themselves on their, the back, but their pledges and timescales to deliver Social Security Scotland have been broken 
But making sure that Social Security Scotland can deliver going forward is what should focus all our attentions and this Parliament as well. Ministers say that they want a system that will deliver dignity, fairness and respect. And I agree. But we on these benches also want to see a system that delivers on time. And I support the amendment in Jeremy Balfour's name. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Briggs. I now call on Ben McPherson to wind up the debate. Minister, if you could take us up to just before decision time at five o'clock, we'd be very obliged. Thank you, President Officer, and, and thank you to <coughs> colleagues um, for the constructive points that have been made. And I think it's been important to remember throughout today's debate that we passed the Social Security Act 2018 unanimously and that what we are trying to achieve here together is a collective investment in people and improving the circumstances for all of our constituents. And in that spirit, since the 2018 Act was passed, we have made remarkable progress. There is more to do, as others have said, but we have made remarkable progress and today I've set out what we will do next. First, I would want to respond to some of the specific questions that were, were put to me. Um, I thought Willie Rennie made a, a very um, constructive contribution and, and he asked me about the delivery of Scottish Child Payment. Uh, and I would just want to, to emphasise to him that uh, Scottish Child Payment applications that were made since the benefit was extended on the 14th of November last year uh, have now been processed. So many have been paid uh, and all have been processed and we expect everyone who is still waiting for a payment, which of course will be backdated to when they applied, um, will get a decision uh, we expect before the end of February. And then of course new applications that happen uh, thereafter will be processed as, as quickly as possible. Um, Oliver Mundell, um, I thought was unfairly uh, critical. Um, he, he asked some points around uh, value for money and, and costs. I just want to clarify that the, the implementation estimates res, remain within 10 per cent of the 2020 programme business case figures. And this is a good outcome given the replanning we undertook during the pandemic and the additional work uh, we are delivering on the Scottish Child Payment. And uh, Social Security Scotland's running costs are expected to be comparable to the Department for Work and Pensions once all benefits have been introduced and case transfer has completed. Uh, and the updated uh, overall total investment costs across Social Security Scotland, the Social Security Programme and the Social Security Directorate are broadly similar to the costs outlined in the 2020 programme business case, dropping slightly overall by about 0.5% over the nine years from 2017-18 and 25-26. Um, I thought um, Mr Mundell unfairly said that um, there had just been a rebranding almost and that there wasn't any difference being made, uh, but I would just um, encourage him to go and engage with constituents who have been recipients of the Scottish Child Payment and he will understand from them uh, the difference that this money makes. It's, we are prioritising investing in social security uh, and of course this has been in a period as Paul McClellan emphasised where we have seen a reduction of social security from the UK government cutting universal credit uh, as an alternative in comparison we have chosen to invest in social security and we will continue to do that. Um, yes, I will. Miles Briggs. Thank the Minister for taking this intervention. The winter fuel payment specifically, uh, ministers were clear in saying no one in Scotland would lose out, but it is now clear that rural communities across Scotland are. Communities uh, the Green member didn't mention, but like Braemar um, and Aboyne, which she represents, will now be out of pocket. Does he regret that? Minister. So there are, in, as I said to the committee, there are around 12,000 um, people in, in, in some areas in Scotland who, who may have got more payments under the cold weather payment scheme. But of course, the cold weather payment scheme is completely unreliable, whereas we are replacing it with a reliable payment. Um, and we have, of course, doubled the fuel and security fund to £20 million and engaged with local authorities in that area, encouraging them to utilise that fund. Presiding officer, no, no I've, 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 I've listened to colleagues and tried to respond, um, but I have some important things to say with my, my time remaining. Uh, and I'd be grateful uh, for, for colleagues' um, consideration of that. Um, I cannot accept the two amendments um, that, have been, that have been put forward, um, and I urge Parliament to reject them on the basis uh, they are, uh, unfortunately, a combination of uh, unhelpful uh, over-negativity uh, and unrealistic wishful thinking. Because the difference between uh, being in government, between sitting here 
uh, and, and sitting in other places in this chamber is that we have to balance what is desirable uh, with what is possible. And we have a responsibility to try and take things forward for the benefit of all the constituents uh, across the country. And since taking on this role, um, I've sought to, to do that as Social Security Minister, um, driven by uh, the four values that, that, incur that um, have always guided me, a bit like the, the four values that this Parliament have. And for me, it's about determination, imagination, courage and honesty. Uh, I've sought with colleagues in government to develop a social security system that not only delivers well now, but has strong foundations for, for years to come, um, as, as, as Miles Briggs emphasised as important, uh, to be utilised uh, to good effect by whoever governs Scotland and in whatever constitutional situation the Scottish people choose as their future. And what we have realised through using our social security powers is that with determination and imagination, we can build effective modern use systems uh, in just a number of years. Um, and I, I appreciate that those systems aren't performing perfectly for everyone, and, and I would um, encourage Bob Doris to write to me about the case he raised. Um, I, 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 it wouldn't be appropriate for me to comment on the individual case right now, but if, if Mr Doris writes to me, I will, I will definitely respond. And, um, others have talked about cases and I would encourage them to, to get back to me because every piece of feedback I receive on the case transfer process um, or on uh, operational matters helps us to, to, to build as perfect a system as we can. But it is, it is performing well. Um, but I also I believe strongly that I think we all need to, to have the courage to honestly accept that and be candid about it whatever our views in this Parliament about what powers this Parliament should have or not, we need to be about, uh, transparent about the realities of change, uh, and I've sought to do that in this role. The, the truth is, um, Home Rule for Scotland, continued devolution, independence, has for me always been more of an evolution than an event. Uh, and the next phase of the Social Security programme is part of that journey. And we will, we will do it well in government, uh, as we have up to this point. And I would encourage others to be constructive uh, and, and uh, positive in their service to the constituents that they seek to represent in coming here in a way that we can build this social security system together, whatever our position on the constitution. Um, because social security staff are making a huge impact every day. And I absolutely salute their commitment um, and their contribution they are making to building a better Scotland. And that is why 89% of people who have engaged with Social Security Scotland rated their overall experience with the agency as very good or good. That is the reality. The truth matters. I mean, even just in recent days, there has been somebody who posted, for example, on the social security social media, social security Scotland social media, saying, you know, I think we are so lucky, honestly, in Scotland to get the amount of help we do. And that's because of the changes that have been made, and that's because of the delivery that is being undertaken by dedicated civil servants in the agency. Absolutely. Because the truth is, presiding officer, and the truth matters, we are delivering more support in Scotland compared with elsewhere in the UK because we know it's the right thing to do. The truth is, more disabled people are feeling empowered in Scotland to get the support they're entitled to, which is why projected spending on adult disability payment is set to increase. We know this is the right thing to do, and our changes are making a difference. The truth is, as Audit Scotland have said, despite the challenges of the pandemic, complex new benefits, including Scottish child payment and child disability payment, have been delivered. The truth is, this is a significant achievement. The truth is, the full rollout of the Scottish child payment has been a watershed moment for tackling poverty in Scotland. The Joseph Rowntree Foundation have said that. And the parents and guardians of the 387,000 eligible children across communities are benefiting from that yeah. and welcoming it and feeling it. Yeah. The truth is, presiding officer, 133,000 carers have benefited from over 2 
£100 million yeah. since we launched the Carers Allowance Supplement in 2018 and will benefit further next year when we launch Carers Support Payment. That is the truth. The truth matters. The truth is, Presiding Officer, there is more to do to deliver with our social security powers, as I and others have set out. But we can also move forward with confidence based on what's already been achieved, with humility about the challenge, but also a sense of common purpose about the further positive difference we can make and will make, particularly if we work constructively together. And so I ask Parliament today to vote for that positive delivery that we can and should make. Let's work together and continue to develop a social security system that not only benefits those who need some help, but also makes Scotland better for us all. I urge Parliament to vote for the motion and to vote down the amendments. That concludes the debate on update on the Social Security Programme business case. It is now time to move on to the next item of business. There are three questions to be put as a result of today's business. And I am minded to accept a motion without notice under Rule 11.2.4 of Standing Orders that decision time be brought forward to now. And I invite the Minister for Parliamentary Business to move the motion. And moved, President Officer. Thank you. The question is that decision time be brought forward to now. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And the first question is that Amendment 7805.1 in the name of Jeremy Balfour, which seeks to amend Motion 7805 in the name of Ben McPherson on update on the Social Security Programme business case, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament is not agreed, therefore we'll move to a vote and there'll be a short suspension to allow members to access the digital voting system.